were if we're noting that a, a newspaper such as the Little Globe that doesn't reach everyone is the optimal effective way, then clearly Will News has fallen far short of Will News. So, so you put Will News out of it, out of business, Will View is uh, falling far short of what it's meant to be achieved. Just to clarify, so the uh, the, the door to door survey I referred to is uh, it's targeted. So this is actually this is, this is focusing on the residents, as I understand, the residents who have subscribed to us previously and then decided not to. So this is identifying those people. They've they've had a brand new subscribed and then they've stopped. And this is about approaching that group of people to find out if you've stopped subscribing. You know, knocking on the door and actually getting some detailed reasons why, as to why, you know, that group might, might be losing people. Um, so, so that's the door. It isn't a general door-to-door survey to attract the cameras and customers. It, it's, as I understand, it's focusing on those people that have subscribed in the past. Christina. Imagine somebody going to somebody's door, knocking on the door and saying, Hello, two years ago you had the garden waste and you haven't got it now. What if you could tell us? Yes, presumably you have to go at night or a weekend, so it's different for me, uh, because they might not be in in the day. Or are you preparing? Do you give them a ring first? And say, so, I'm going to come over and talk to you. I think that's a little bit badly thought out if you want to get information on people. So I think we get the backs up. I think if you came to me and asked me something like that, you might not get a polite answer. Uh, that's me. <laughs> but what I'm also concerned about is that we're so far down the road of this and these people just seem to have realised that they're not making the savings. Now, in, in the world that I inhabited, or my husband inhabited because he owned a company, if you had set out to meet targets, you would be reviewing those targets on a <coughs> short-term period fairly new thing. And if after the end of the say quarter nothing was happening, you would review it again. Now can you assure us and can you tell us when those reviews took place and what strategy they actually had in place? Because apart from the free gift that we got from Green Hands plus from my garden centre, I don't think I got any other offers. I mean not because I care and I I'm perfectly happy to pay the money to have my garden waste taken away. More than happy to have. I would, I would actually pay a lot more to have my garden waste taken away because I have no other way of doing it. And, but I don't think it's right either that the dry summer went, meant that we didn't have so much garden waste because I had a lot more because things grow more in the summer. Yes. Okay, that's my question. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. I'm not, there, was, there was a number of pertinent statements there. I'm not, I'm not sure where the, uh, where, where the questions were. I think there's something there around seeing that we're getting a variance from projected income. So, you know, talking yeah, to, talking I to asked our you, colleagues. When did, they, when did they review? Because if you set up something to say you're going to save money, you surely review it to see that that's happening. So how often did they review? When did they notice there was a problem? Why did they do something about it? Which now, when so we're in the last quarter, coming into the last quarter. Secondly, do they, are they actually going door to door to people's houses, like cold sales? People don't answer the door, Mark. Remember, I sold better wear for 18 years on this. People do not answer the door. Through you, Chair. So we have a robust approach to financial monitoring throughout the year, which involves month monthly reports being prepared by PG's colleagues, and they culminate in quarterly reports that come here. So as we've gone along, and from an officer point of view, we, we keep a very close eye on all of our income targets and projections. And certainly, I know that our commercial team, led by Nikki Butterworth. She's been keeping a close eye on this issue and will no doubt be taking on action on this as she's seen variances emerging. So I'll give you an update on the things that the team are looking at. And I've got a list of bullets here in high level terms as to the kind of things that they're doing. I've not been involved in the detail of that, but they've given me a list of the kind of things that they're doing to get things back on track. And it's not stuff that they just started doing. They've obviously been on with this for um, you know for, for a period of time. 
Um, and all I would say, I understand is that those door-to-door server, it is purely going back to those people that have subscribed before. That's the only information I've got. But I'm happy to... Please, please, on how many of the people who subscribed that they called on have actually decided to redo it? Seriously, how many of the people who subscribed and how much it cost us to send those people out to collect it? Okay, thanks very much. Peter, can I thank you? Every applause. Steve, sorry. I, I, I really, you know, we can't sit here because I know the council waiver is a guest or a deputy tonight. We did have a full report on the middle view. We opened it uh, in public. We talked about the middle view and made suggestions about its coverage and and all those issues around that. So it would appear that whatever the opportunity is, whether they've went scrutiny or whatever it is, they try and get the subject back to their best subjects that will view, or the whole golf resorts, or whatever they think they, 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 that they, they should buy. I would draw members' uh, attention to the performance reports. Actually, carbon waste is increasing uh, at a time of austerity and it's holding its own. So the, the, the performance claim. There is some effect in it, and it's held on its own in terms of numbers up. So I think they got my eyes are right around the 39,000 mark, which is quite remarkable considering we our original projections were around 35,000 for the whole program. So there is some, some uh, good news to, to be had around that subject. So um, the other suggestion is that, yeah, we did put budget proposals forward, and circumstances change, and issues change, and they're not always successful. I put this challenge to business committee last night, December the 4th, over at, you know, we've got a workshop. If you have ideas that are more sustainable and better to save this council money, then you have a perfect opportunity to bring them forward. If you've got an idea, bring it forward. Let us know. We'll do feasibility on it and see whether it stacks up. Not every budget option always stacks up. That's the, the idea of budgets and reserves. By and large, we are doing okay with the budget given massive austerity cuts forced on us year after year. Another £45 million pound this year. £45 million. Maybe it's absolutely breathtaking money, we're about to say. And some of these ideas for, are, aren't successful, then that's probably the nature of the business. We, we're, our job here is to have regular reports, we're doing our job, we're challenging, uh, and that's the job we did. But if you've got ideas, bring them forth on, on the 4th of December, um, and the officers will work with what we're putting in the budget. Um, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to come back on that. Far be it from us, Councillor Fabs, to point out where the Labour administration is failing in its delivery in this authority, because you actually lead the authority, that's the whole point. So you've you, you completely um, missed the point of the scrutiny committee. We're, we're here to point out where failures have uh, uh, happened. So, so, we have, so, so don't take offence when we point out that the world view is failing miserably. But it's, it's not we we're picking up on any opportunity to highlight it. It's not working, and it's not, we're, we're justified in actually highlighting. With regards to uh, the budget proposals, and we're sound like a stuck record because it's the third time I say it, but this is for the folks at home watching. If anyone's watching our very expensive camera system at home, I'll be very surprised that they are. But <clears throat> we actually offered you about five or six years ago, we offered you the committee system whereby we would all work together. All parties, cross party, will actually sit and vote on uh, different ideas. We come forward with ideas. You didn't want it. You wanted the strong leader model, which means that Phil is the authoritarian, uh, dictatorial leader with his cabinet and anthem. You make your, you make your decisions, and we scrutinise them. That's that's the process. You voted for it. You wanted that process. That's what we've got. So give us the ideas. Give us the budgets, and we will pull it to pieces where we think it's fair. That's that's how it works. Just remind Tony, he did declare a non-political interest, it's a non-political uh, scrutiny committee, and I would have thought if anyone had a good idea, then they could bring it forward at the budget workshop and we could, we could work on it. If you've got no ideas, then just hold your hands and say you've got no ideas. But... You made it political, Steve, by highlighting what we did, or not being happy with the fact that we were highlighting that something that you have decided on as a government has failed. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't complain that someone's making it they're speaking politically when you've already started it on that path, you did. Right, thanks for that. I'm move on. I am going to move on. I am going to move on. Peter, thank you for your involvement. Thank you. Thank you.
recommend, the recommend, the recommendation is that we note the report. Yeah. Everyone happy to note the report? Yeah. 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 Thank you. That brings us to item four, which is a kingdom performance update. I'm going to invite Mark to give an update to members on kingdom performance. And before Mark does give his update, can I just remind members you have received the report by email. So everyone should have a copy of the report that's been sent out by email. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Chair. So, um, just just as a recap, then. So, we uh, we started with the Kingdom contract uh, back in August after a thorough calling uh, process by, by this committee. Um, as members, you've already agreed on your work plan for the year that Kingdom are going to come to the January meeting. So. I think, Chair, uh, uh, you've already pointed out that we've got quite a light meeting in January, so it isn't the finance and the performance report at the moment. So there's a, a very healthy period of time in January to scrutinise the Kingdom contract that's in the plan at the moment. And I'm also pleased to confirm that we've got Michael Fisher, who's the managing director of Kingdom. He will be coming along with his teams at that meeting really with the key purpose of uh, you know, six months in giving the contract a very, very detailed uh, airing. What I did commit to do, and based on the interest from members uh, at the call-in, uh, I did commit that at each meeting just to give a very brief update on performance and, and how things were going. It would have been a verbal update, but I think members suggested it's a good practice if we could just send something out of the maps, which we have done. So all I'll do is just, under the circumstances, just very quickly uh, pick out some of the, uh, the highlights of the performance so far during the first three months from August. So in that first uh, first quarter operation under the new contract, uh, Kingdom have served 1,393 fixed penalty notices, uh, and of those, we've, we're on a 48% uh, payment rate so far. We've done some analysis around the kind of fixed penalty notices that have been issued. I know members in the past have been interested in the percentage or the proportion that relates to cigarette litigants, obviously very early on. I think it was a very high, high percentage. And at the moment, that's tracking at uh, about 81% at the moment of, uh, of, the, of those uh, fixed penalties related to, uh, related to dropping uh, cigarette ends. Um, we've also done, uh, in the note, there's some more detailed analysis around the breakdown by parliamentary constituency committee area, uh, by, gen uh, by gender and by age as well, but I think that's there for members to see. So far we've had, uh, during the period, we've had 113 informal appeals, uh, where people haven't been happy with the conduct and being issued with an FPN. Um, and of those, uh, when, when we've looked at them, one of those has been successful and the, uh, and the FPN has been subsequently uh, rescinded. Uh, and I think just a final point, I know that members have been interested in what happens if people don't pay and if uh, these cases actually find their way to the magistrate's court. So as we touched on last time, and the note just provides a little bit more detail around that, um, uh, what we actually do is, um, when we go to court, uh, we will, the council does look to make an application uh, for its, its legitimate cost to be covered. So if a fixed penalty isn't paid, we do incur costs around preparing materials for court, office of time, additional legal support, etc, etc. We do look to recover that. Um, please to advise that in the majority of the 700 cases that have been determined by the courts during that first three months, uh, full costs have been uh, awarded and uh, obviously brought in income to, uh, you know, to pay for those extra resources that the council is happy to find. So um, I'll probably leave it to that chair. I'm happy to, uh, happy to take uh, questions. Obviously, just, uh, I will just point out we've got a very detailed review at the next meeting in January. Jerry? Just a, just a quick one. Uh, uh, didn't, did you say 
in the gang, you've got, you've got 450 people out of 1,000 who paid their fine. You've got 550 who haven't. How many of that 550 may you actually take the school? So, while the figures look reasonable, I don't think there's enough emphasis on dog power, and I don't think there's enough detail around you know, people who don't pay. What percentage of people who don't pay are actually pursued further? Uh, and, and what percentage of them are actually cost more to get? Okay, thank you, Chair. I think, first of all, um, uh, I think the Council's comments about the dog fouling, I think from an officer's point of view, I think we, we absolutely agree. You know, dog fouling is a serious issue. Uh, I know sometimes around this committee we've, we've talked about the practical side of dog fouling enforcement and actually catching the offence. So, inherently, it's a more difficult enforcement activity. But notwithstanding that, it's a really important area, it's an important part of the council. Ten is a pretty small number, and certainly I think you know there's a great opportunity in January to be, I think it'd be really important to actually play that discussion with, with Michael Fisher and actually see, see where that discussion takes us. I think so, so thank you for that. Uh, I think just in terms of the, uh, the process of payment then, so one of the things that, I haven't got the detailed numbers to hand, but one of the things that we did when we were preparing for the January meeting last year, and I'll make sure we do it for next time, is that then uh, we have some people that don't pay, but then cases, might not be, Ken can help me out here, but cases then don't find a way to court, we'll have people who actually pay before it gets there. And I know we've done some work in the past as to when, you know, how far people go through the process and do they wait until they've got to the magistrate's court. So it's that other 55% and how many of those actually, you know, once they realise that they are going to court and to pay, how many of those just pay early. So we'll, we'll come up with a, a, a percentage breakdown under those headings for, for when we come back next time. Um, I think my understanding came in terms of the, the legal cost that we incur when we get to the magistrate's court. So we, we have a pretty big approach where we make sure that we cover our costs uh, as far as we are able to, and that's a green light to cover that. Yes, um, in, in relation to where we're at, uh, some of these cases are proved in absence, so there's a set fee that we ask for which um, is that £130 to £350. Uh, and that is for all the paperwork and all the representation that in those is a set thing we, we, we uh, come to. If the case is appealed, it goes to a trial, and obviously that increases the level of costs. Um, and those costs could be uh, doubled or tripled depending on the time of the issues or the nature of the any defence that is submitted. Um, and in those circumstances, um, it, and it's always been the case, it's going to be within the discretion of the court to either award full costs, as sometimes they do or a proportion of costs, uh, and that proportion will be based on the income the individual has, um, and also whether uh, when it comes to trial, um, there is, uh, it has to be effective or whether there's a guilty plea in the meantime. So there's a number of factors that the court have to determine uh, as to whether, uh, as to whether the fine and also the level of costs um, uh, that are asked for. Thank you.
of scrutinise this in detail. There's a there's a payment mechanism where for the for the for the FPN figure, I think a certain proportion of that comes to the council and a certain proportion comes to the kingdom. I can't remember offhand what those precise numbers are, but I'll make sure that in the covering report for next time that we've got all that detail around the contract mechanism, how it works, and how we're making them. Just not going to happen, unfortunately. Just to clarify, it's not what the proportions are, it's, it's where the king can get paid and we don't get paid. <coughs> that, that's yeah. that, where they get paid for our books. And, and just, just a, a note, I know I've, I've sent you an email about like this, and just, yeah. just sort of have a public record. Obviously, in recent years, some press about the king and wants that. And I just wonder whether it's worth, just why we have the scrutiny committee. Um, whether you could just got any comments on that. I know you commented that you've been reassured, but can you just reassure this committee yes. that you're confident given that the, the detail that they come out in the press that the, con the council's confident in the contract? Okay. What are your thoughts on that? Okay. Okay, just uh, just a couple of bits which um, I'm happy to cover them briefly, but no doubt we'll, we'll get into more detail in January. Uh, I think there's a there's a few notable things that happened. So obviously members will have picked up from the press that uh, just over the water the Liverpool City Council have terminated their contract with Kingdom. Um, I'd really just reinforce the point that in, ad in advance of awarding this second contract to Kingdom, and obviously you've, you've all been involved in that calling process, <coughs> we've been very happy with the company that we're awarding the contract to. Um, assigned of uh, a couple of contracts in the local area, in Liverpool and in North Wales, where there's been some issues, where, where some authorities have had issues with Kingdom's performance, Certainly, when Michael Fisher comes here in January, he will be telling you a strong story that they've got over 30 other contracts across the UK, all working very, very successfully. Birmingham City Council, who are the biggest council in the country, they're in their tenth year with Kingdom, have a great working relationship with them, and as part of this overall journey around achieving behaviour change, you know, they speak very highly in Kingdom. So there may have been some local issues that hit the press, but overall, Kingdom have got a very strong track record across uh, across the UK. Um, I'm not going to contact, you know, comment on any detail around what's happened in, uh, in Liverpool, but uh, what we do know is that obviously the environmental enforcement contract in Liverpool has come to an end, and as I understand it, there isn't a successor arrangement in place at the moment. So uh, my understanding is, is that Liverpool at this moment in time don't have a capability like this. And I just I just really reinforce the point I made earlier that as environmental professionals and practitioners in this area, we consider and members have always really supported the environmental enforcement and having a capability like this is an essential part of that overall approach of achieving uh, you know, a good quality environment and achieving a change. Sorry, just on the uh, just on the final point around, I know there were some issues about um, staff conduct. So uh, I think all I can say is that just in general terms, um, and certainly going back to the first contract with the Kingdom, from what we've seen, they've had a very rigorous approach whenever they've had any staff conduct issues you know, within the company and they've dealt with them in a, in a very robust manner. In the past it has involved at least you know, one dismissal in the past of, of, of officers who are not displaying right conduct. So our, our experience so far is a very, very strong approach on, uh, on staff conduct matters. And just the final point is that I know that Mike Cover and the team have been working closely with colleagues in Merseyside Police. Merseyside Police have been really, really supportive. And we've got uh, a number of live investigations where, as I mentioned last time, we've had some attacks on members of Kingdom staff. Those are staff who might be employed by a contractor, but they're out there on the council's behalf, essentially acting like council employees. And obviously we take, we take such issues very seriously, and, and Merseyside Police are, are working uh, very close with us on that. Thanks, Paul. Christina. Well, on the, <coughs> the briefing paper we have, it says. Uh, don't we need Use your microphone, please. Just... 
sorry, it says um, in the first course of operations, the first of October, so it performs the United Street big issue. And then it says approximately oh, oh, 1176 and 10 dog thousand have been issued this quarter. So what's what made up the difference? And also, then it says approximately 113 informal appeals have been received and dealt with in the first quarter. One of these has been successful. Does that include where Kingham have decided not to pursue the person? Because I've seen at least three letters from Kingham to my residents where that's happened, where they've produced CCTV and Kingham have backed off. And also, it's not a question, it's a horror. And I'm horrified to read that Bevington have had 159. I don't live in Bevington, I say now. I, I, I live in Cloudsbridge where we only have two. Um, but I'm also horrified, and I'm sure less than many will be, that Wallace has had 170. <coughs> I mean, when the guy comes, are we able to ask him if there's any sort of like hot spots? Towns centres, Christian. Towns centres. Yes, but... That's where the town is. But Bevington doesn't have a town centre. <laughs> <laughs> because Bevington's town centre is shared with, with Catterbridge, and therefore we'd have equal. Um, it just seems 159 in Bevington. seems a heck of a lot. So I'm just wondering if they... where they've been. I'd love to think it was outside some of the schools. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that, Chair. Just uh, on a health point of detail, so I've just, uh, someone just whispered, whispered in my ear, so, uh, so uh, Liverpool have terminated their arrangement, but I think probably, as I understand it from a member of the audience, we are in the Liverpool in their notice period, so I think yeah. I've just been advised in a few month notice period, so I've, uh, I've just mentioned that in case anybody was wondering why I was getting this. Thank you for the contribution. Uh, just in terms of the, uh, the overall numbers then, so um, just to clarify, I think the question was around the total number being 1393 yeah. and then 1176 for litter and tank for dog fouling. Yeah. The, the, the difference there in the number relates to the new smoke-free initiative that we started uh, a couple of weeks into the contract. So that's where the other, that's where the difference of uh, 200 comes from. So, so what okay. was the name found guilty of? So, so that would have been, uh, that would have been, that under the, under the smoke-free legislation, that would have been smoking in vehicles uh, and uh, taking enforcement action on, on that as well, around smoke-free and air quality. So, so that's like smoking vehicles when you put the charge in there? Yes. So, so as members will recall, so when we entered into the new contract, uh, and I think briefly mentioned in the note, we have broadened the scope of the contract to, uh, to move into new areas, uh, enforcement of smoke-free legislation, uh, littering from vehicles, and also trade waste enforcement as well. So that, that's a... That's a new area for the contract. Um, Sorry, can I come back on that? If it's law, can we give somebody else that jurisdiction that presumably the police should have? Yeah, yeah. So you can go to school. Smoking, it, it's against the law to smoke, so it's against the law to smoke in the car when you have a child in the car. And Mark's just alluded to that's where <coughs> that's good. Those are. But I'm just saying, have we given over, have at least given over that responsibility as well? Because I understood that it was against the law, not mm -hmm. like. But it's criminal law, not civil law, isn't it? Yeah, it's criminal law. Yeah. So I don't think it could be about the criminal law. Well, the local authority prosecutes a lot of criminal law in relation to the whole raft of legislative issues, whether it's health and safety, trade, uh, um, Food safety or anything like that, this would have been something that would have been delegated down to the local authority within regulations or within legislation. And the local authority would then have, would have uh, endorsed its officers to be able to carry out these functions and to issue the appropriate uh, notices or law or penalty uh, notices. Okay, and then just uh, I think the other question was around the, uh, around the 113 informal appeals. Yeah. So, uh, Without, without knowing the detail of the one, all, all I would say is that as we've discussed here before, there will be occasions where Kingdom legitimately 
we serve an FPM, but then we do receive information which means that it does need to be rescinded. So a good example of that is if they issue a, an FPM for littering to someone who appears who is a teenager and there's a question about their age, obviously if they then provide evidence that they're under 16, I think it is, or that age, then obviously we automatically uh, repeal that functionality notice. So we do, we get a number of those and, and they're, they're entirely to be expected. And then just the final point, which I hope we will have for the uh, more information on for the next meeting. When Mike Coburn has come in, we've talked about um, uh, environmental quality across the board and where we are getting littering and where we're getting enforcement. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this idea of we're trying to get you know, this GIS mapping system up and running, yeah. which, which clearly shows that correlation between the district centres and where we are getting the littering and where we're then targeting the enforcement activity. So, Hopefully we'll have something more on that for the meeting in January, but clearly uh, the Kingdom offices will be you know, targeting their resources in the best way as to where the problems are. So do Kingdom still get the money, even if it's in, because they issued the notice even though it doesn't go anywhere? So it didn't ask us to Yeah, but I'm asking you against this one now. So what's the answer? I'll, um, in, in terms of whether a notice is uh, well, appealed, yeah. In the case of the ones where everything's not right, they yeah. haven't checked it out, do they still get the money? My understanding is no, but I'll, uh, I'll make sure we come back in the meeting January. Thank you. Councillor Burton and Councillor Faust. Thank you, Chair Adam, and it's an honour to be part of this committee. It's the first time I'm here, um, and I haven't been party to previous discussions about the Kingdom. And I was also kind of expecting portfolio holders to come to scrutiny committees to be held to account on, on their areas of responsibility. Is that the back? It's the okay. yeah. And is Kingdom your responsibility? Okay, great. Right. And I assume we could invite Anita to the, the next uh, event on this issue. To, to that sound like. uh, sorry, thank you. Just, just through you and from a uh, constitutional point of view. So just as a just a reminder, I'm not speaking on behalf of my cabinet member, but just to, obviously just as a general reminder that obviously Councillor Leach is a cabinet member who sits on the executive and there's obviously supposed to be a distinction between the executive and the work of the committee. So I think as I understand uh, Ken, so uh, you know we we obviously make sure the cabinet members are invited to come along and observe the proceedings. And I think the cabinet member can choose to speak or contribute if she wishes, if he or she wishes. But obviously, just to reinforce that that important constitutional point that there's a separation between executive processes, decision-making processes, and the reason for us being here tonight, which is essentially uh, scrutiny. If, if we could, just, just, just hang on, just, just hang on a minute, please, Councillor. Does that answer your question? Um, no, I'm confused there between executive and cabinet. Um, right. You just don't want to get a legal point on that. Mm -hmm. Well, well, yes, obviously, um, this is through the committee, made up of members. Um, Councillor Leach is the um, cabinet portfolio holder for environment and as any cabinet portfolio holder, in respect of the portfolio they hold, they can attend the committee, uh, and if, if necessary, and as and when committee, the committee can invite her to uh, address issues, or she can ask to address issues uh, relating to what the cabinet's uh, view is on a particular item. Uh, and that's the distinction between such that has no casting vote or any vote in relation to any issues that you address this evening, that's a matter for you. And clearly, she's obviously making a note of anything you said to go back or to consider any views you have going forward. Yeah, so, would you kindly invite the portfolio holders to come and uh, answer questions and the answer account? If, if you wish, if you wish. Obviously, that's not good. Uh, it's a matter for the kind of portfolio if you want to respond to an invitation from yourself to, uh, to attend and address certain issues. And okay. Councillor Leach is there uh, raising her hand now and she wishes to have any comments on it, any comments.